I want to let you know that we have a couple of new cards up here for discipleship. If you want to take these home and begin practicing these, but this week is whoever wants to be my disciple must design, deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. As you're turning to the book of John, Jonah, I do want to tell you that uh, even if you do not have children, you need to go downstairs and take a look at, at especially what's happening within the gym and also the children's wing here. Uh, it has been transformed. It is incredible. And I took uh, a couple ladies down there, and they were just blown away. So please pat those folks on the back. And also, Jim Pape has been uh, doing puppets for 25 years. And so the blood has permanently pooled in his shoulder. So uh, make sure to, to go thank Jim for all of his hard work. Well, if you remember from a year ago when we talked about the story of Jonah, that it actually begins in 2 Kings chapter 14. And there's a, a king that has just been put over all of Israel named Jeroboam II. And, and like his namesake, Jeroboam I, he's an evil, wicked dude. And he is leading the entire nation astray and following down the same path as Jeroboam the first, leading them into wickedness. Well, all this is happening, and about this time, Lord sends word through his prophet Jonah that he's going to allow Jeroboam the second to reclaim the border towns to the north, effectively expanding their country back to the, the time when Solomon was king over all of this. So all this, this happens. And the reason that the text gives us that God allowed this to happen is in 2 Kings 14, verse 26 and 27. The Lord has seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help him. And since the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. So the reason for Jeroboam the second strategic and, and military advances what was not based on him and, and it was not based on the, the purity of Israel because if that had been the case not only would they have not reclaimed this area they would have lost ground but it's only because of God's buying compassion for his suffering people Israel he decides to do this so God's desire to help and God's desire to save his defenseless people eclipsed what was really happening there and we see that his great grace is just unquenchable here so it's in his mercy that god is free to save whoever he wants wherever he wants whenever he wants it's up to god to decide how he wants this to take place so that's what's happening here so we see this here in the text but let's remember this pattern that we see just from here in second kings chapter 14 so you have the word of God, where it originates. It all starts with God. And that gets passed down through the mouth of his servant, Jonah. And it's executed through the hands of the king. There, in this case, it's Jeroboam II. So that's the pattern. It starts with God, communicated by his servant through the hands of this leader here. But God's care and compassion are not going to be geographically limit, uh, limited by what's happening here in Israel, God wants to put the same pattern into practice. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. Okay, well, let's see if we can put the same formula from 2 Kings chapter 14, because Jonah is very familiar with this. So the word of God is going to go out, and, and this is how Nineveh is going to be going to be delivered by the word of God through the mouth of Jonah his prophet by the hand of the king to lead the Ninevites back to repentance okay so we've got this plan we're ready to go this is what God says he wants to happen Jonah 1 and verse 3 but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish he went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port after paying the fare he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So it's the same pattern as before. It, it, it's not that this was uncharted territory. Jonah knew what was supposed to happen here, and the power of God could bring this about. Well, then why is suddenly the middleman taken out of this equation? 
Well, hopefully by, by reading some of the passages in the rest of this book, we're going to figure out what's going on within the heart and the mind of this now rogue prophet. But first, let, let's start with God. Can you imagine he's up there and he has in his mind that he wants to save this people? And so he immediately goes to his go-to guy. This is the spiritual leader that he's chosen. His best man, his number one agent, his number one sales guy. Jonah, you're the guy. You remember what you were able to accomplish, Jeroboam the second? Let's do it again. Now we're going to go, we're going to cross borders over into Syria. It, it, it just doesn't happen. Because when called, Jonah hops on the slow boat to Tarshish. And the storm kicks up, and sailors, you know, go, go back and forth. What are we going to do? Well, we chunk him up. Uh, they, before they chunk him over, they ask him, exactly who are you? We, we know all of everyone else on this, on this merchant vessel. We don't know you. So perhaps this is because of you. Tell us a little bit more about you. Here's what he says in Jonah 1 and verse 9. He said to them, I am a Hebrew, God's chosen people, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry ground. Okay, so he's got the rhetoric down. I know who I am, this is my identity, and this is what's going on. So you ask, I'm telling you who I am. But apparently there's limits to God's lordship, and there's also limits to his fear, aren't they? There has to be something, as he's weighing this, he knows who God is, he knows what the plans are, and, and he knows to fear God, but there's something else tipping the scale. And that was his anger, the stuff that's brewing inside of him, he knows all this, but he allows this to tip the scale. What upset him so much that he agrees to leave town and to flee from God? Well, there's two things. Number one, he didn't like the call. He just wasn't happy with it. God lays it out, understands it clearly, because I, I don't like this. So he gladly accepted the call when it was for Israel to expand their borders and, and, and to make God's people look great. He's like, I'm all about it. I'll go talk with Jeroboam. We'll get this plan rolling, and I'll tell him, you've got God's backing. Get the army, rally the troops, uh, beat the, the plowshares into swords. Let's go. God's with us. God has sanctioned this. We're, we're on board for this. But in, in 2 Kings 14 and in the book of Jonah, Jonah gets a, a courtside seat seeing the grace of God. So it, it was not that he didn't understand who God was. So why the opposite reaction? Well, Jonah struggles unsuccessfully to reconcile this same justice and mercy that God extended on behalf of Israel being used on their enemy. I, I, I don't like this. I, I don't like what they're doing. The, he's now extending the same justice and mercy on, on the Assyrians in the city of Nineveh. Do you know how wicked they are, God? Are, are you not aware? Are you not hearing the talk on the street? Maybe I need to bring you up to speed. How despicable these folks are. Now you want to go save them? Well, cooperating with God in the salvation of their own people was a privilege. But cooperating with God in the salvation of their enemies was altogether different. And Jonah just says, forget about it. You've got the wrong guy. I'm out of here. You know, I was, I was in seventh grade. And I, I got to qualify this story. This is pre-baptism. So just, just hang with me. I, I had a run-in with a teacher named Mrs. Bott, and I didn't have a problem, per se, with a teacher who was born and raised in, in India, but I did have a problem with a teacher that had spent a very little time in the United States teaching us Texas history. I mean, it, it was just weird. She, she's from India, and she's teaching us, who, you know, a lot, born and raised in, in Texas, and, and, and grown up there, she's teaching us. And so we got to hear a lot about the Alamo, and, and we got to hear about David Crockett. I'm like, it's Davy. Who's going to get, you know, it's Davy. You know, and Jim Bowie. And I'm like, no, it's Bowie, the Bowie not you. Know. So I'm having to correct her, which probably wasn't the best idea. And, and I probably did cross the line today when she wore her, her sari, and I asked, I said, I didn't know it was pajama day. And... Uh, Pre-baptism, pre-baptism, okay. And my parents didn't know anything about this. Well, report cards came out, and they, my parents looked, and all A and B is, that's great, but what they were upset about was the U in conduct. 
And so they started looking at this and asking questions. And so Miss Bont blew right past the end for needs improvement and was straight for you for unsatisfactory. Now, all my other conduct grades were E for excellent or, or S for satisfactory, but I had this one U. And so I kind of played it off to my parents since my daddy was an engineer. I'm like, well, if you look at the whole body of my work and what's happening, this is obviously an outlier. It's an anomaly in conduct assessment, and therefore it needs to be disregarded. And, you know, obviously my teacher has issues. It, it's not me. And, and then also I said, she's from India. Maybe she's confused. She thought you was for unexplainably good. You know, and my parents were not buying it. So the next morning, my mom at breakfast says, I, I want some more information as to what's been happening. Well, I'll tell you, no, I'm, I've, I've heard your side. Uh, I, I want you to deliver this invitation for Miss Bott to come over on Friday night for dinner. I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, Can't you be a normal parent? Just do a parent-teacher conference. No, we don't have her over at the house. And, you know, but I think it'd be great. And so there I, I had to, to take this in, and she accepted on, on the spot. And that Friday night, they, her and her husband had a great time at the house. I'm just miserable, you know. And uh, after dinner, I was excused, and Miss Bott kind of brought my parents up to speed on the rest of the story. And after they left, I was clobbered, okay. But I was so mad as a seventh grader that my mom put me through this. Because in my mind, Miss Bott was the enemy. And I was her son. Why was it important for my mom to make things right? Why was it important for her to mend fences? The school gear was almost over. But it was important to my mom. And so to, to say I was a reluctant messenger when I carried that invitation was putting it mildly. And if we lived closer to the ocean, I would have hopped on the boat to Tarshish instead of taking this thing. I did not work him over. But you know, fleeing from the Lord's presence... Jonah announces emphatically he's unwilling to serve God. Have you ever gotten to that point? Stanley Schiff, one of my mentors, talked about that every morning he has to tell himself, I'm willing to go to Bangladesh. And it sounds odd, but he said, that's the one place I don't want to go. But if I ever get to the point where I have to tell God, I'm not going to Bangladesh, God will say, you have to go. So I tell him every day, I'm willing to go. So that was... But he wanted to keep his heart from getting so, so trapped there. But his actions, Jonah, are, are, are nothing less than open rebellion against God's sovereignty. Seeing being with God kind of necessitates being, being willing to be a part of God's will and doing God's work. That's what it means to be in God. It's not just that we have been saved and, and have given our life over to him. It's actually doing the thing God wants us to do. Not just having this relationship but putting that faith into action, it's not always something so dramatic as saving Nineveh. But get this, everything we do should reflect the heart of our Heavenly Father. So as people see us interacting, the bare minimum, people should be able to see God by the things we say and the things that we're doing. For Jonah, that meant going to Nineveh and expressing the heart that his Heavenly Father had for those people there. And apparently, Jonah but this meant doing something that with his enemies, it, it was just beyond his limit, and he was not going to cross that. Well, in addition to not liking the call, the second thing is, is Jonah, he didn't like the conclusion. He knew how this song was going to end, and he, he didn't like it. He didn't have a problem with, with God saving Israel, his people. He didn't have a problem with, with God choosing to do that, but he didn't like it that his salvation was limitless. He didn't like it that God wanted to extend it. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he feared that he would fail. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew the people would repent. And he knew the heart of his God. He knew that, that he was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He was merciful. He was gracious. And he was, he was ready to forgive and, and desist from the punishment that they deserved because he had seen it firsthand. He knew that his people didn't deserve it. And this is what God did. He says, I don't want that to happen. We wear the white hats. The Assyrians and, and the people in Nineveh, they have the black hats. The good people are on this side of the border. The bad people are on that side of the border. And I'm not going. He just couldn't get his mind around it, nor did he want to. 
He knew the outcome of the mission. So Jonah also knew that there was something else at stake beyond the people repenting. He also knew that for Jonah, that it, it meant he was going to lose control and that God was going to ask him to give up his narrow worldview. Rosemary Nixon says this, insofar as a person seeks to go beyond themselves to love their enemy and to break through the boundaries of their safe existence, they may experience a justified fear of loss of control. We don't like losing control, do we? We, we like all of our ducks in a row, especially when it comes to the way we do church and, and the way we respond to God and our faith walk. And though we can't prove things here, or, or we, we just like the things the way they are. And we don't like things to, to be messed up. But sometimes when we're confronted with new truth, or we're confronted with a calling that God gives us, when we're given that and we, chose not to, we choose not to do it, that's open rebellion. It is. And we have to realize that. And we have to be willing to change. And for Jonah, he failed the test. And through God exercising his lordship anyway, Jonah went ahead and did it, kicking and screaming. But he had limits to God's rule in his life. Places where he felt like he had to draw the line on God's authority. Saying, God, I, I know you told me to do this, but I'm, drawing, I'm not going to do that. And God says, yes, you are. You know, we hopped on the boat. He was still holding on to this illusion that he had the right to govern himself. And this is something that I wrestle with as well. You know, he won the privilege of being labeled God's servant without the responsibilities of actually carrying out God's mission. So, I, we, we, boy, did, I'm, I'm on the roll here, but am I willing to allow that lordship to change how I interact at school, in the marketplace, in my neighborhood, in my marriage? Am I allowing that lordship to control how my actions are? So, sometimes that's, that, that's different. That's difficult to do. You know, in the final chapter of Jonah, after the people hear the message and, and they finally repent, we, we, find, we find Jonah just sitting under the big vine the Lord's allowed to grow, to grow up. And he says, I just wish I could die. Can you imagine having 120,000 people repent and, and are brought into the fold of God? And he's like, I want no part of that. I'd just as soon die. It, it, to me, what, what he's asking here is, is God going to be sovereign? It, am I going to allow God to be God and me to just be a small part in God's grand story he's doing through all of creation? Or am I going to put my foot down and say, I want no part of this? And so we see at the end of the book that, that God's asking, and he's saying, can I be concerned about who I want to be concerned about? That, that's a question not just for Jonah, not just from the people in the New Testament that use this this story every year at Yom Kippur to talk about this. It's a question for us. Are we going to allow God to exercise his will or have we drawn little lines and limits as to what we think God should do? What about us? Here's some things for us to consider. Number one, God is serious about you. He is. He doesn't give up. In spite of Jonah's arrogance and sin, the prophet can't shake God off. He tries to go the, end, the opposite direction, the ends of the earth, and he can't hide. He can't lose himself. Or he can't put himself in such a foul place that God washes his hands. I tell you a lot of times when I do counseling with folks that talk about their, their past, the overwhelming thing that they se seem to lack is hope. They, they feel like that their actions have brought them to such a point that God has gotten so disgusted by them that they're just, God says, I I'm sorry. Our, our Heavenly Father is not like Pilate. He doesn't wash his hands of us because he's so disgusted. God says, if anything, I'm going to come closer to you because I'm worried about you and I want you to come back to me. God wants to, to do this. And we see here in, in Jonah, he doesn't just allow him to go. He sticks with him. And you know, he causes the big storm. He causes the guys to throw him over. He provides the big fish. He provides the vine. And he provides the worm all to show him. If nothing else, I'm going to be an irritant with you, Jonah, until you come back and see my heart and see my love and see my mercy. That's what we get from this story. I love what Martin Luther, how he describes Jonah. 
he referred to Jonah as an old saint who's angry because God's mercy for sinners, begrudging them all the benefits and, and wishing them all the evil, and yet he's still God's dear child. <laughs> that brings hope to me. Uh, sometimes I, I want to write myself a note to the 70-year-old Brad saying, okay, you've got to keep allowing God to keep shaping and, and directing you and allow God to keep using you all throughout your life. You know, it's the same with you and I. The Lord is with us when we succeed. And he's with us when we fail. And he's with us on, on the bright sunny days. And he's with us as we've been singing about during the storms of life. When our world is just coming apart. If you don't believe me, I'll, I'll read footprints. No, I won't. I'll spare you that. But, you know, God does carry us during those times. And sometimes we think he's far away from us. But God is with us even during those periods of lives. In, in our life, when we choose to live in open rebellion... Talk with parents who their their teens and young adults have have left the family. Have, does their love change for them? No, it aches. It aches in a different way, and that's where our heavenly Father is. He doesn't give up with us. If we're going through periods of rebellion. Well, what should our response be when we understand His grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness? The Bible tells us is fear. Is fear. Proverbs nine and verse ten says, "The fear of the Lord." is the beginning of wisdom. And it, it's fear. We're not afraid that, that we're, he's going to do something, but it, it's in, we're afraid of God because we tremble at his incomprehensibility. Jonah narrowed his perspective as to who God was. God says, let's open that up. Let's expand the boundaries, the limits of your heart so you can see the heart of, uh, that, that I have. And God's doing that all the time to us, isn't he? He's showing us different, different aspects of him, and we need to allow that God to grow as we understand him more and more from Scripture because he's a big God. And when that begins to happen, then we can finally begin to trust him. When we see how big he is, he truly can handle the problems we're going through. The second thing is God's serious about all of his children, not just us. And that's something that everyone needs to be reminded of. You know, I don't know of a what it is, whether it's a person, whether it's a country, you know, whether it's a group of people, who it is that's your Nineveh. The people that you say are, are beyond what, that God can reach them. But Second Peter 3 and verse 9 says, the Lord is patient. He's waiting because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants them all to be reconciled. He wants us to be a part of the reconciling process. No one is off limits. If we ever get to the point where we're saying that person's done, scratch them off the list, we know for sure that we're entering into an idolatrous relationship with God because that's not what God's heart is. God's heart is for all of his children to return to him. That's what we see here in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. When your worldview doesn't include some person that, that's your enemy, then you're moving beyond what God's heart is. What did Jonah do when he discovered this? Well, I'll tell you in just a moment. Several years ago, I had a, a young man in my youth group named Greg Gocher. At the time, he just finished his junior year in high school. His two older brothers were out at Oklahoma Christian, and they were contacted about spring break by a missionary who was uh, in, in his early 70s, who every summer goes on an old yacht and tours around the Canary Islands he needed some young men to help him with the rigging and, and to guide his boat as they sailed out because he was getting too old to, to man that. And so his two brothers came on. They asked Greg, do you want to be the third person or should we ask someone on campus? And Greg is like, you bet. Well, his parents weren't wild about all three of their sons going on this, this journey all summer. But the first thing they did when they were there in, 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 in the harbor is the missionary gave them a tour of the boat and talked to them, not only about how the boat works, but the dangers of the boat. And he issued each of the young men a little sheath that went down their ankle that had a knife in it. He talked to them about the importance of always carrying that knife because he said the ropes in the rigging are very dangerous, especially the rope that's attached to the anchor. Well, they've gone on for most of June and part of July, and Greg talks about that there was a three-day period where they didn't sleep hardly at all because the storms that they were battering the ship and it was keeping them from going to their destination. And finally, they, they gave up and turned around and went 
back to the island they had just left, and they were all exhausted. Greg was bringing the sailboat in, into the port, and as he got closer, he lowered the, the, the nets, and then he grabbed the, the anchor, and he threw it overboard, not realizing his left foot was wrapped up in, in the coil of the anchor rope. Well, his two brothers and the missionaries were down below, and I don't know if they were sleeping, but they definitely weren't paying attention. In an instant, that rope grabbed him, yanked him off the deal, and he found himself 30 feet below the water surface. And he said he was frankly trying to do everything, and the more he, he wrestled, he got that rope all turned around. And he said but when he, he stopped flailing, he found himself turned upside down, and he remembered his knife. And so he reached up with his hand, and he undid the clasp. But when he did, the current and gravity caused his knife immediately to slide right past him. He saw it go right past to the bottom of the harbor. So there he was, stuck. He'd been there for over a minute. He remembers just looking up, realizing he has no way of getting out of this. He saw the sun up above him. He remembers just, just having a peace and a calm that came over him. And, he, and he, he offered up a prayer. He said, during that time... He wasn't thinking about his family. He wasn't thinking about his girlfriend. He wasn't thinking about his buddies. He wasn't thinking about school. He wasn't thinking about work. All he was thinking about was his relationship with God. He said it was a moment of remarkable clarity. He said he made peace with God and offered up a prayer. And as he was, he said he'd been down there under two, over two minutes at this point. He said he offered up a prayer of amen. At that point, he was going to release what air he had in his lungs and take in water and prepare to, to go meet his heavenly father. He said at that moment, he felt the tension release from the rope up above. He could see it, it kind of coming down through the water. He was able to free himself, and with one last burst of energy, waved his arms down and released the water and was propelled towards the surface. His brother, his older brother, had, had wondered why he hadn't heard any footsteps up above and had gone. Didn't see Greg up on, and he said, just per, by chance, if he's caught in this anchor rope, I'm going to cut it. And sure enough, he saw his brother coming up dove in and helped him get onto the ship. Well, Jonah went through this same period of exasperation and this time of flailing around, but this time it, it wasn't a rope that held him, but it was seaweed that had him in, his ga in, in, in the grasp. And so he's in this futile moment of desperation. He finally gives up. The seaweed's got him, and he offers up a prayer. Jonah 2, verses 7 and 8, he describes this moment. He said, when my life was ebbing away, I'm giving up. I remember you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you in your holy temple. You have a pen. So mark this passage. The scripture blew me away this week. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. You know, that's our choice this, moment, this morning. We can hang on to our ways. We can hang on to our understanding. We can hang on to our boundaries. We can hang on to our limits. But limiting God and his plans and his will and his direction, loving only those that, that we want to love and, and serving God as we see fit, as Jonah describes it, he says that's idolatry. And as I see this, I, I see how futile that is. The invitation is for us this morning, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, ask yourself, are you moving towards Nineveh and a better understanding of God's heart and God's mission for you? Or are you moving towards Tarshish, away from God? We have the rabbi, Sheldon Blank, said this, Tarshish is anywhere that you go where you turn your back on God's calling. Run to him. Trust in him. God is calling you, calling you to a deeper understanding of him, a deeper understanding of his heart. He wants you back. He's pursuing you. We can help you this, this